Uh, this is our, our last panel of the day, the last panel of our three-day symposium. Uh, thank you all for your persistence in being here this long. Uh, we appreciate it. And, and this is uh, a kind of potpourri of our educational and training program, a number of the uh, fellowships that have emerged through the years uh, to talk about. And um, uh, Lauren, you've already heard introduced earlier today, is, is taking over the joint PhD program. You've already started, haven't you? Transition is happening. All right. Transition is occurring as we speak. Uh, and Lauren will be moderating this august panel of educators. Um, thank you for all the panelists for being here. Um, it's, it's exciting for me to be part of a group of people who share that passion for um, really kind of taking folks um, in that kind of sensitive periods of, of um, people's professional development and kind of launching them to the next steps. And I think of, of many of the fellowships um, on this, this panel, these are really our tomorrow's uh, colleagues. They, many folks will go on to be faculty and be, be our colleagues. So um, I'm gonna keep my comments short and, I'll, and I think we can just go down the row and, um, and I'll have folks introduce themselves for the, for the sake of time. Um, and if we can try to stick to just a few minutes. Yes, I'll be, I'll be quick. Thank you. So hello, I'm Desiree Shapiro, and I'm filling in with, for Dr. Heineman today. She couldn't be here. Um, but I am going to be stepping into the role of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry Fellowship Director this July. I'm very excited about that. Um, and before I go over my very quick points, I just want to take a moment to um, acknowledge Dr. Heineman's dedication and service over the last 23 years. She's grown the program, I think, from two to now five a year. She's expanded clinical sites and really prioritized education and has done a great job. Um, thinking about our faculty and the child and adolescent psychiatrists in the community, she's trained most of us. So, yes. Uh, so the vision for our fellowship, um, we have a really wonderful team and we all love teaching. And I think we, we do want to continue that prioritization of education. Uh, Dr. Ben Maxwell has been hiring a lot of um, new faculty and with that comes knowledge and experience. So we're excited to learn from our new teammates. Um, we also want to collaborate with no national and local experts and also with other disciplines and specialties. Um, clinically, we're really strong. You heard about some of the programs earlier today, and it seems to be always growing and innovating, so that's wonderful. And then two tracks that are very strong and upcoming, so the community track led by Dr. Schweitzer and Dr. Ko, wonderful clinical experiences and um, really wonderful mission. And then for research, Dr. Cara Baggett and Dr. Geed, as long, along with the support from Drs. Caden Head and Swerdlow, we're going to be creating um, you know, more of a research direction, so we have that part of our fellowship. I'm Steve Hughey. I direct the Geriatric Psychiatry Fellowship Program. I think when I came here roughly three years ago, I quickly realized that I had both the pleasure and the challenge of standing on the shoulders of giants between Dilip Jeste, who is the original program director, and Dan Sewell, who is our most recent director emeritus, and just the strength and wonderful program that they had built. Um, if you've ever gone to the American Association of Geriatric Psychiatry meeting, um, it is very apparent what a presence UCSD has within the geriatric psychiatry community. So it was a tremendous honor to be um, joining that community and to directing the program. And I also would be remiss if I didn't thank my two colleagues um, who really helped carry the weight with me, Kal Yuvardi and Huang Nguyen who have really worked with me to kind of help strengthen and develop our program in new directions. Um, geriatric psychiatry is, I think, a very interesting field in that we have one of the fastest growing populations, but also in terms of there is a challenge in terms of recruiting people to our field. We're quite fortunate here at UCSD in that this past year we had three fellows. Um, to give you an idea, there's about 70 fellowship um, <coughs> positions across the country, 70 fellowship p programs across the country. Um, on average, um, in the United States, there are about 50 fellows that graduate. Um, that's across the country. And so for us to consistently have two to three fellows a year is, uh, I think, a real testament to the work that um, my predecessors and my colleagues have done. I think 
one of the things is we think about what has sort of been termed the silver tsunami and the, the growing population of seniors that is that is here and is will continue to come our way is how do we train the next generation of leaders to care for this cohort, which is an incredibly sophisticated cohort. Um, you know, as the baby boom generation is really coming into retirement in their golden years, you know, how do we provide health care in what is also a very rapidly evolving health care system? So as a fellowship um, program team, you know, how do we train the next generation of geriatric psychiatrists to not only understand and navigate this healthcare system as it is in 2019, but what will it be in the 20, 30, even 40 years when they're practice, you know, as they practice throughout their entire career? And so I think that is our unique challenge. Some of the things that we've been able to do is um, that I think represents a real important aspect in geriatric psychiatry education is deep and close collaboration with our partners in geriatric medicine, but also looking for opportunities in the community, also looking at building partnerships with non-physician partners, um, nurse practitioners, psychology, everyone who will, is and will be involved in the care of older adults. And so how do we craft a program that will ch train in, um, the future generation of geriatric psychiatrists? So I think we certainly are, we have a great foundation. I think we'll continue to grow. Many of our faculty have been through our program and it's a real pleasure each year to see our graduates join our faculty, Dr. Vardy, um, soon Dr. Lee, um, Dr. Damla, Dr. Kokash, um, joining what I think is not just a geriatric psychiatry fellowship program, but a geriatric psychiatry community. So thank you. My name is Preeti Ocha, and I'm a faculty member in the community psychiatry program. I graduated from the fellowship last year. And uh, I think there are three cornerstones to our program that I would want to highlight for you all today. And the key here is really that we're not an ACGME accredited program, but I think that there's a lot of value in pursuing either an education or a career in community psychiatry. So the first cornerstone for me was clinical exposure. Through the Community Psychiatry Fellowship, I was able to rotate with a number of community-based organizations that allowed me to understand how to provide psychiatric care to very unique populations. So some of those include Survivors of Torture International, where we work with an organization that is servicing people who are here in San Diego seeking asylum, usually for political, having been politically tortured in their home country. We're the psychiatrist to the deaf community of San Diego. And then we work with San Diego Youth Services, where we work with a number of different populations in the child and adolescent world, uh, those who have been sex trafficked, the LGBTQ youth community, those who have some experience either with the juvenile detention system or those who are at risk for having a legal history in the works. So based on those community partnerships, I think the second cornerstone is that um, we're taught how to manage and how to understand various systems of care. And that was really what led me to pursuing this fellowship. I wanted to understand what is psychiatry outside of traditional academic medicine? What's happening outside the walls of UCSD Health System and the VA? And I definitely think I have learned that. Um, and it's, it's actually quite different, I learned. The third cornerstone is leadership development. So part of our didactic curriculum in our fellowship is geared towards figuring out what is psychiatry today? How have we gotten there? And what role can we play both as individuals and then as a department, as a program, and as a health system in further advancing how community psychiatry is practiced in the years to come? Uh, we have 17 graduates. The first program, uh, the, the program was first developed in 2011. Since then, we've graduated 17 fellows. And all of them have pursued, and that includes some of the folks in the child track that Desiree had mentioned. All 17 of those fellows have pursued a career either in public sector or pursuing an academic faculty position like the two of us. Desiree is also a graduate of that Community Psychiatry Fellowship. Um, I think that's all I need to say. Thank you. Okay. Um, hello, I'm Tina Bays. I am the program director for the Consultation Liaison Psychiatry Fellowship. Um, 
And I am uh, now the second uh, youngest fellowship because the Addictions Fellowship has, has just uh, come on board. But uh, the CL Psychiatry Fellowship is a fairly new uh, fellowship. It's uh, been developed over the last, let's say, four years. And I do want to say a little bit about, about the beginnings of the program. Um, specifically, uh, Nilu Afari, who is the Associate Chief of Staff uh, at the VA right now, and Maria Tiefs and Kassab were very instrumental in the initiation of, of the program with the support of, of UCSD. Um, and uh, the way actually we started is the VA uh, recognized a, a need for interprofessional teams in mental health. And so they specifically put a call out uh, for folks to apply for educational positions and training programs for interprofessional teams. And so I do want to say that, that at that point we, we applied for uh, psychiatric pharmacy positions, uh, uh, behavioral medicine psychology fellows, and for a psychiatry fellow uh, and, you know, to be part of this interprofessional team. And that's one of uh, the very unique features of the fellowship. Um, as part of that, we, uh, we got the uh, CL Psychiatry Fellowship ACGME accredited, and so that is freestanding on its own and is moving towards, uh, we've had one fellow, we're going to move towards having two fellows, but it is within also this interprofessional team. And um, what's unique about that uh, uh, is, uh, so on the inpatient consult service, we have um, a psychiatry uh, fellow, we have a psychology fellow uh, seeing the inpatients, we have a pharmacy, psychiatry pharmacy resident working together as a team. They've developed such a really outstanding reputation that we now have medicine interns rotating um, with us. Uh, we also have a sub-internship, so it's a very, uh, exciting kind of training group to be working with, very fun. Um, and so this team uh, is, is providing interprofessional care. Uh, we do some interprofessional education. Uh, the psychiatry fellow um, also rotates, uh, as, uh, besides inpatient, rotates as part of uh, integrated pain team um, in psycho-oncology and also in collaborative care. And so uh, CL Psychiatry has long been kind of viewed as more of an inpatient um, specialty, but uh, really over the uh, last period of years, it's become very much an outpatient uh, specialization. There's a great need for this kind of um, specialty in different medical settings. And I'm a little bit biased, but the CL Psychiatrists or Collaborative Care uh, Psychiatrists are really the face of psychiatry um, to our medical and surgical uh, colleagues and to the hospital. They interface with the hospital a lot. And so I kind of view us as ambassadors of sort in terms of generating goodwill and providing good work uh, to help our colleagues take care of their patients. Um, just to mention a, a couple of things that I'm particularly proud of. Of course, uh, so we're just about to graduate our second fellow, and, and I'm very proud of the fellows. I'm, uh, 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 one has published a, a case report. One has uh, been very active in a quality improvement project focused on uh, a shift handoff tool for continuity of care uh, during the daytime to nighttime, which is critical for patient care. Um, uh, one has been involved in uh, development of a, a hospital-wide policy, a medical incapacity hold. Uh, for our, our medically ill patients with delirium that should not be placed on psychiatric holds. Um, they uh, have been involved in joint M&M conferences with internal medicine and in hospital-wide education, uh, 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 including nurses, social works, other uh, specialties, et cetera. And so I, I'm very proud of that. Uh, the other uh, last thing I want to say I'm very proud of is developing this um, fellowship has really led to the development of a great faculty team of um, behavioral medicine psychologists, of uh, psych CL psychiatrists, and of psychiatric pharmacists. We, um, we are starting to submit things together, present things together, a lot in the area of interprofessional education, and we're actually working now with uh, the Simulation Center at UCSD to develop uh, a simulation for the internal medicine uh, residents, the psychiatry residents, and the behavioral uh, medicine um, interns and, and fellows uh, in a collaborative care uh, uh, simulation. So that's very exciting. Thank you very much. 
Uh, good afternoon. My name is Nick Mellos. And so I'm here to talk about our Addiction Psychiatry Fellowship. So thank you to Carla for really putting uh, all this effort together. Uh, Robert Antonelli for being a, a strong and supportive mentor. Igor Grant as well and others. Uh, so as all of you know, uh, we are in this uh, addiction crisis here in, in the United States. Uh, and having a, an addiction clinical fellowship is uh, really important. Uh, given uh, the expansion in psychiatric clinical care that's ongoing uh, nationally as well as within uh, UCSD and including the VA. Uh, so I, I think it's a terrific time uh, for, for us to have this fellowship. Uh, UCSD is, is really, I think, one of the best, if not the best place to have a fellowship given our clinical resources, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the depth of our faculty, uh, and um, uh, our, our numerous partnerships, including our international partnerships that Igor will talk about shortly. Uh, so from the perspective of being a fellow here at UCSD, uh, uh, it really um, would be a top 10 experience uh, uh, clinically, uh, just given just the breadth and the resources that we have. Uh, so one of the things that I'm here to do is to help entice people to come and be part of our fellowship, and I, and I think um, part of it, I think, could help just share a little bit about my experience. And, and I think this really dovetails what Carla talked about with MI. Uh, I think our most challenging patients, some of our patients that really burn us out, are folks with addictions. I was working with uh, an attending last week um, who was struggling to put limits on a patient uh, who was using cocaine and alcohol and was getting tramadol and clonazepam. Uh, and felt entitled to use cocaine and alcohol and stay on tramadol and clonazepam. And you can see this attending just burning out in front of your eyes. Um, and I think, I think what, what people struggle to understand is there is an addiction phenotype. They are manipulative. They are challenging. Uh, they are sometimes your worst patients. Yet, yet, just reappraising the situation and understanding that that's just the addiction talking, uh, you can also uncover and understand uh, uh, the beauty of these folks. These patients become, at least for me, some of the most endearing patients. These folks, once they have uh, the most priceless intervention, which is time away from drug use, um, blossom. They recover. They go back to school. They become effective parents again. And it's kind of like working with a person with borderline that you also are endeared and connected to, except when it works, the timeline's much shorter. It's not years. It's actually months that you notice this, this, um, this blossoming of, 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 um, of this person and, and, and coming from that shell of, of it and aggression and demanding and manipulation to, you know what? I like my life. I can do it. The challenge is helping these folks also navigate the relapses that happen because frequently it's that second relapse that's more devastating than the first because when they've, when they've had that second, they say to themselves, I promised myself I wouldn't do this again and I'm back in it. For, for us, and I know this is true for Carla, uh, a big part of what we do with our residents and our students is to help them experience empathy and to recognize that an addiction, addicted individual, their decency is hijacked. It's, there, it's concealed behind the manipulations, concealed behind the, 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 um, the drug seeking and the challenging and the lies and the deceit. And I think if, if, you can, if we can help uh, uh, people understand that, it's, that these are folks that when you push it away and that, and that neurocircuitry of addiction that is, you know, is, is demanding repeated use and negative affects settles, they blossom. Uh, and so I think, I think nothing, nothing beats um, the, the uh, being able to do this work successfully without the fellowship. Uh, one of the challenges with the Addiction Psychiatry Fellowship is we're in competition with the addiction medicine boards. It's easy to spend a year on SARTIP, which is our residential program at the VA, qualify for the addiction medicine boards, become board certified. Um, and, and you know what? It's a great experience. I'm not saying it's not. But to be in a fellowship allows there to be uh, um, 
a real integration of, of concepts. Uh, as a fellow, you are in charge and, and are leading teams. Uh, you have to make uh, more challenging des uh, decisions. Uh, um, you find yourself being burned by these patients, these veterans who, you know, got you fooled and you're now prescribing clonazepam on buprenorphine. I've done that before. Uh, it, it's, import <laughs> it's important, I think, if you're in that fellowship uh, uh, to have, it, it provides a, 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 an environment to really blossom as an addictionologist. Carla and I both were blessed with that experience and I know that um, we're both passionate about this fellowship because we want to bring it here. What, what Carla has done, and I've helped, but really Carla really takes the credit, is we've developed a, 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 a really outstanding uh, a set of experiences for, um, for the incoming fellows. So we have, a, uh, we have two uh, fellow, uh, positions, one that is sponsored by the VA, one that's sponsored by UCSD. And we have designed a program where for the first six months, one experience will be predominantly one of the programs and then less so in the other, and then the, the second six months, the flip, uh, the, the opposite will happen. Uh, and I think, I think what happens, what will happen with this is that it really will showcase uh, the, uh, the strong attributes of both uh, programs. So within UCSD, we now have our affiliation with Betty Ford Hazleton, which is terrific. Uh, we have the IOP and the outpatient services that are uh, 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 being uh, currently developed and under Carla's uh, uh, clinical directorship, uh, as well as Pat Judd. Um, so the, the UCSD has a, uh, has a tremendous clinical experience for the fellows. At the VA, we have a long history of providing residential programs, outpatient programs. We have, we're linked with the, the, the national mandates, which really are uh, strong for, for VA. There are also strong research mandates for VA and a lot of research funding uh, coming towards uh, addiction services as well. So I think, I think this partnership in, in, uh, around this tremendous faculty that we have, uh, I think really will make it a, uh, a, a top 10 uh, fellowship experience uh, throughout the nation. We just need to get our first fellow, and, and that's partly why I'm here. So thank you. Uh, my name is Igor Kutsunok, and I'm with the uh, department since 1996. I'm a professor of practice. There are actually very few people with that title professor of practice in psychiatry. Uh, so I've been with the department for the last 23 years. Uh, and initially I was recruited by a great mentor and a very dear friend, Dr. David Deitch. You probably know, many of you know David. And I worked with David for a number of years at the Center for Criminality and Addiction Training and Research and Application, which is a part of the Department of Psychiatry. Uh, and then David retired in 2007, uh, I think 2007, and uh, so I got the I got into the leadership position. I became the director of this uh, center, although we are still, I'm still asking David al almost daily for his advice and support because mm -hmm. I frankly, there are many occurrences when I really don't know what to, what to do. Um, and the primary function of this center was uh, workforce development and competency building in people with different professions who provide addiction services to individuals under criminal justice supervision in a variety of settings, not just in prisons, primarily in prisons, but not only in prisons. People who are what we call them justice-involved clients. Uh, then in uh, the late 2013, uh, I when I, I was appointed as Director of Treatment and Prevention um, at the United Nations Office of Drugs and Crime in Vienna, so I moved to Vienna, and I spent three years, almost three years, uh, so w when, when I got there, that was exactly the situation, mind what you wish for kind of <laughs> situation. I got there pretending what I'm doing, and. Uh, so I got there and I started learning about what is happening around the world and globally in um, addiction medicine and addiction treatment. And I've seen enormous amount of nonsense, enormous amount of human rights violations all over the world, enormous amount of really things that really they, they, they go against common sense. So I started doing something about it and one of the things that I thought we need to do, and I, I think I, uh, this was a right decision, uh, at that time, we didn't have any uh, standards, global, international standards, minimum standards of addiction treatment that all the member states at the UN can agree upon. So they, there was nothing like that. 
so I managed to convince in my conversations with the UN leadership that we do need a set of standards. They agreed that it took four months, that it, which was relatively quick for the UN. Uh, they agreed. Uh, and then I started calling people that I know, calling with world-class reputation and world-class competencies. Uh, calling people to come to the end, I cannot do it alone. So we managed to put together a group of really world-class experts from all the continents, and definitely I called some of my people that I knew from UCSD Psychiatry, and uh, Igor Grant and Mark Shackett were kind enough to fly all the way to Vienna, and they did a phenomenal work. As a result of that, in 2017, the UN General uh, Assembly, they uh, accepted the resolution, so the international standards of treatment uh, of substance use disorders do does exist, it, the, the whole set does exist, so I came back to the UCSD in 2016 after, after I served two consecutive terms with the UN, and uh, we um, established an addiction technology transfer centers, one in Ukraine, uh, which is a SAMHSA funded, and another one in Southeast Asia, with, uh, it, it housed by the Chiang Mai University in Thailand serving seven countries in this region. Uh, so one of the things that, that I'm trying to do with the help of my colleagues uh, around the world is what, what Nick said about the, the, the crisis, the addiction crisis in the US, definitely everybody is complaining about the gap between the research that you guys are generating, the world class, the first class research, very sophisticated, very complex science, and the implementation, the real practice. That's actually what I do. I'm actually using your work, the research that you are generating, trying to, to translate it into a language understandable to practitioners, translate it into a set of implementable skills, and then assist people in actually correctly, correct implementation of the science that, that you generate. So a p big part of my work and my colleagues' work around the world, considering the crisis outside of the US, which is significantly more severe, is not just science promotion, but, but something that I honestly refer to as nonsense reduction. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so th 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 this is what I do, and I really want to thank you because I do use the results of your work, your science, the products that you generate, scientific products, uh, for the sake of people who are practitioners, not just in the United States, but globally around the world. Thank you. All right, thank you. So my name is Brian Bazella. I'm here to represent the VA's uh, clinical psychology postdoc program. And so our program really does situate itself within the context of a scientist practitioner model, such that many of our fellows come from incredibly productive um, research one institutions, and at this point in their career, are really deciding that the majority of their time is gonna be spent in the implementation and dissemination of clinical practice. And they're really interested in learning from experts um, who both develop and research gold standard interventions, which RVA and UCSD obviously have a well-deserved, incredible reputation for. Um, so our fellows, the majority of their time is in implementation, supervision of junior students, um, attention um, training, as well as the involvement, um, their own conduct of research and dissemination activities. One of the things that's been really exciting as I've been involved in this uh, program is to see its growth. So I was a fellow here in 2010, I'm sorry, 2011, 2012. I was in the internship prior to that. At the time, there were six of us. The program started with four. At this time, this incoming cohort will actually have uh, 14 residents coming in. And so there's this incredible diversity of um, settings in which our residents practice. Everything from primary care mental health integration through consultation liaison, um, behavioral medicine. We have folks doing couples therapy in PCTs, the mood clinic. Our PSR fellowship, Psychosocial Rehabilitation and Recovery, has actually gotten uh, national recognition from organizations like the American Psychological Association's Division 18 as an exemplary training program that really sets the standard for what training in psychosocial rehabilitation uh, should embody. So we're incredibly fortunate. And as many people I think have said across the panels, the reason we're able to do that is because we have such an incredible group of supervisors. We're fortunate to have roughly 35 faculty, uh, primarily in the clinical supervision, and then additional folks, uh, including those primarily situated at UCSD in the research supervision. We do a mid-year and end-of-year self-study with the residents every year, and consistently the, the single most 
um, sort of loudly echoed piece of feedback is the supervision here is so much, um, I'll even go so far as to say so much better than even what they've gotten at any other point in their training, despite coming from in training uh, incredible training programs. Um, many of our supervisors are trainers in the modalities that they're teaching the residents. So they nationally go around the country, including tra training other VAs. And our residents are really sensitive to the fact that they're getting this incredible opportunity and incredible exposure. Um, in terms of where our residents go, so this training year we'll actually graduate our uh, 100th resident. So across since 2008, uh, I think it'll be 110 residents at the end of this training year, which we're um, incredible proud of. And the residents have gone on to do wonderful, incredible things. Um, two thirds of our residents have stayed in a VA setting where they can continue to have a hand in clinical supervision, in clinical um, services, as well as in research, um, ideally. About 20% have gone on to more traditional academic university um, or department positions. With the growth of our, the UCSD Clinical Services Division, several of our fellows have now headed that way and have been very um, appreciative of that opportunity and, and have felt like they could contribute. Um, and so I think one of the exciting things about our fellowship has been that even in this context where there's a huge amount of additional money flowing from the VA into postdoctoral funding, such that many fellowships across the country have difficulty retraining, uh, attracting and retaining residents, and they have to give back money every year. Every year, our fellowship is in a position to request additional funding because we have so many more people applying mm -hmm. than we have positions for. And every year, the Office of Academic Affiliations knows our reputation, and they're more than happy to give us those additional funds. Um, and again, that's really um, due to the commitment and um, the involvement of our faculty. Thanks. I'm Lori Lindemer, and I'm going to be talking to you today about the VA fellowships. I just want to let you know that I <coughs> have a little bit of respiratory condition and ongoing that I was treated. I got treatment. I went to urgent care last <laughs> night. No, it's not contagious. <laughs> it's <laughs> asthma related. <laughs> so uh, anyways, I apologize. If I hope I don't have to cough, but I, I'm, I do have a little bit of shortness of breath here, So, which means I'll probably be briefer than I had intended. Um, I think what you heard about it was a lot about the uh, department's ability to develop synergistic partnerships, and we heard a lot about that with regard to psychology and psychiatrists. We also have heard a little bit in this morning about the relationship between the VA and UCSD. And I think that this has been particularly fruitful um, partnership with regard to training. The VA has had a long-standing history of training and committing funds for trainees. Over 70 years, there's been the Office of Academic Affiliation that has been focused on training, and training in mental health as well, all kinds of training. And it has been a, a number of these funds <coughs> and programs that have been supported that have allowed us to bring in some very um, incredibly talented uh, research clinicians, clinician scholars. So what I'd like to um, tell you, in, in addition to it being a long-standing um, commitment of the VA. The VA has also been, and you've heard a lot that, that Tina has mentioned, is the interprofessional. And just to kind of give you a scope here locally of what the VA's investment is in training, we have in the in mental health care line right now 90 trainees that are in the mental health care line. So this is in, interprofessional. We have psychology, psychiatrist, chaplain, uh, social work, and um, pharmacy. So what I'm going to focus on right now are the five programs. Um, one of them I'm going to talk about first, it's, it's a hybrid program. It's kind of between the one-year clinical fellowship and the two-year clinical research fellowships. And this is the neuropsychology fellowship. It's formerly been in existence about two or uh, three years. Um, it is headed by Mark Bondi and Amy Jack. It's a two-year fellowship that has 50% of its time clinical research and 50% of its time in a uh, clinical setting. And so um, we uh, will be applying uh, for accreditation as a specialty at, for APA um, in this coming year. The other four programs have been in existence a bit longer, and some of them very long. Um, and that MIREC has been um, supporting training of fellows since, the, um, since they actually started having this funding mechanism. So over a decade ago, um, the MIREC 
the mental illness research, clinical and education programs, centers, as well as the Center of Excellences, um, have a, a, f a training program that is uh, in interprofessional in that it has a, a PhD and an MD component, and it is 75% research and 25 clinical. And I have to sh do a huge shout out to Ruth O'Hara and Sherry Baudreau, who have really managed this program. This is a national program that has 26 sites, and she has a VTEL, and every site is on there, and she calls roll, so she has eyes on every one of the fellows that are in this, in, in this fellowship program. So the two programs of the MIREC and the CSAM fellow, the MIREC fellowship psychology program is uh, led by Barton Palmer, and Greg Light is overseeing the MD component. The CSAM fellowship psychology component I'm overseeing, and I'm, Duline Baker is overseeing the MD fellowship. We also have other funding mechanism streams, so we also have a program in women's health, and that is um, Ariel Lang is now the, uh, directing the psychology portion, and um, uh, Karuna Huja is, uh, Huja is seeing the um, MD fellowship in primary care. And then we also have the addictions program. Tammy Wall is the director of the psychology portion, and Scott Matthews is uh, um, of the MD. So. <coughs> What I really want to do is um, let you know about the success of these programs and their outcomes, because data speaks for itself, right? So I'm going to start with the clinical psychology, the psychology programs. Um, we had we went formed a group of putting together all four of the MIREC, CSAM, Addictions and Women's Health, and went in for APA accreditation. So now we are an APA accredited program. Um, we have had. Our outcomes, we have 84% of our fellows have gone on to either DOD, VA, or academic departments or centers. Um, the other ones have gone on to um, um, other health centers. Even more striking is our success with career development awards, which is the, the VA parallel for a uh, K award. We have had, um, in CSAM, we've had um, of our 13 fellows that we've had, we have had seven CDA awards. Um, and um, we are working very strongly at having CDA applicants for both the, um, well, for, for the MIREC. We have an application in pending, we're waiting to hear. We have um, some developing, newly developing ones in, in addiction. And we have um, some that have been submitted for women's health. So we're looking forward to having as much success in those areas as we have had with CSAM, the Center of Excellence for Stress and Mental Health. Um, I just briefly end by saying that we have also been um, very active in working on the recruitment of MDs. I would say innovative ways, but it, it's not really that they're innovative ideas because a lot of people have them. I just have to say that we've been really persistent in working on the implementation of them. And this is to get the physician scientists, to get the MDs to come into fellowship programs. Um, we have uh, partnered with UCSD, with um, Dr. Antonelli, Greg Light, Neil Swerdlow, um, to reach, develop a pipeline where we're reaching down to the research residents and engaging them in some of the VA programs uh, prior to, to their um, graduation and then we are then able to um, work on bringing them on. The way we're bringing them on is also kind of creative in a dual relationship, or a dual, it's called a dual appointment, where they get paid as a fellow for their fellowship, and they get paid as a clinician for their clinical timing, and this helps um, offset the, the big difference that you see in payment of, of fellows um, in the community versus um, doing the fellowship program. And then also we've had some innovative programs that um, with regard to partnering with ACGME fellows. Um, Duleen Baker and Emmanuel Lehrman, one of our fellows, have worked with Department of Pain Medicine to uh, develop a partnership. And Steve and um, Greg are very actively pursuing one with a geriatric psychiatry ACGME fellowship. And Nick and I have had conversations about doing that also for the addictions. Mm -hmm. So I'm telling you all of this, the person who has played a huge, huge role in this M MD recruitment is Greg Light. Now, he's supposed to talk about um, other fellowships, but he's really been such a strong advocate 
not only at the local level, but at the national level in terms of um, the MD recruitment. And I just wanted to make sure that you knew that in case he didn't take the opportunity to tell you and was a little bit too shy to boast. But I will leave the nugget about his work at the national level um, of recruiting physician scientists. Well, so I'm Greg Light, <laughs> and I'm the last speaker <laughs> and the last day of a three-day program. <laughs> and the la the, oh, there's one more. So I will be brief because I know we're running a little bit over time, but I, I do want to thank Sid and the panelists and members of the audience for sticking with us, for Igor for helping to, to launch this three-day celebration of the 50th anniversary of our, um, of our department. As I was sitting here doing the math, um, 1969 to 2019, I realized that I have been here for about half of the duration of the department. I originally um, met David Braff at the Society for Biological Psychiatry meeting in 1994, and then I joined the JDP working in his laboratory. From there, I completed the internship program that you heard about in the previous panel, and then I went into the T32 program and uh, stayed on. So this has been a terrific celebration. I, I spoke with Igor during the coffee break, and Igor said that, you know, you've been here for a long time since pretty much the beginning, and um, Igor has learned a lot about our department, and he's been chair for five years. Um, and I have too. It's been really nice to, to be here and to, and to hear from the panelists and see the audience. I, I see out there, I think I know pretty much everybody, and most of the people here are, are deeply connected to our department, either as faculty members, um, I do see a current trainee who we're recruiting into one of our research fellowships, Samantha Friend, a physician scientist. <laughs> so, and uh, we have one other future recruit, that is Nick Mellos' daughter, who's up yes, there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> She's currently a high school student, but um, we're starting to plan <laughs> these things out <laughs> further and further. Um, as you may have heard earlier, we have 28 different training programs, 355 trainees. There's research involved in most of those programs in, in one way or another. Ten of those are, are research, ten are clinical. We have four T32 programs. This is an excellent environment to do your research training in. And, um, Yeah, the T32 is an NIH-funded program uh, that supports physicians, psychologists, and basic scientists in developing uh, their research careers, ultimately geared towards building people to become leaders in either academic medicine or in neuroscience, neuropsychiatry. And so I completed the T32 in biological psychiatry and neuroscience. And now, as Lori mentioned, I work within our VA program, the, the MIREC, uh, and uh, that is a research-based program. All of these research programs um, have excellent mentors. It's a superb environment, and they are somewhat, I would say, innovative in that we allow for custom tailoring to the professional development needs of the trainees to choose their mentors, to choose the kind of research that they wish to pursue. And um, I'll just highlight that um, one of the other things that we do in addition to trying to build better salary structures for our fellows uh, is building professional development seminars, things that um, Neil Swerdlow and others, many panelists, have contributed to that are department-wide programs where we offer talks on things like how to give a talk, how to build a private practice, how to set up a lab, how to negotiate with your chair for resources, how to basically um, do the things that you will need to be successful in your careers. Uh, these span not just the research areas, but the clinical domains as well. And um, I really do want to thank you all for um, 
especially the, those of you that have contributed and, and the different levels, for making this such a great environment that even dummies like me can grow up in and be homegrown, a term that I know Igor is very fond of in particular, is the director of the Center for Medicinal Cannabis Research. <laughs> and so um, I will stop there and just be brief and um, pass it back to, 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 to our moderator. Thank you all for sharing about your programs. It strikes me what a labor of love it is in the kind of development, the growth of some of the programs that have been going on for a long time and then the new ones that have been birthed out of um, with a lot of, of work and collaboration and creativity and innovation. Um, I'm also struck by the reach of these programs at the kind of trainee level, at the patient level, and at the faculty level of how many faculty are engaged in to, to these programs. So thank you for all of the, the hard work that you're doing.